So yes, I spent my summer studying uh, subduction zone earthquakes from the Hikerangi margin. Um, they were recorded during the Hobbits uh, project. So <clears throat> this is a schematic diagram of the tectonics in New Zealand. Um, the Hikerangi margin is uh, part of the the plate boundary between the Pacific plate and the Australian plate. At the North Island here, or more specifically, the part of the margin that we are interested in, this convergence rate is happening at about 50 millimeters per year. So why are we interested in this part of the margin? Well, first of all, this has been the site of the slow-slip events that have motivated the Hobbits project um, from which we've collected our data. So HOBIT stands for Hikurangi Ocean Bottom Investigation of Tremors and Slow Slip. Slow Slip can be thought of as a sort of silent slow motion earthquake in that it ruptures the fault, um, but it doesn't generate significant shaking because it happens over an extended period of time. So for this region, or for this reason, um, geodetic techniques are used to detect these events and to model them. So uh, onshore continuous GPS and also uh, seabed pressure gauges. Uh, so during the Hobbits project, there was a two week long slow slip event that generated um, about 150 to 200 millimeters of slip in a two week period. So if you think back to the convergence rate uh, at, at this part of the margin, this is equivalent to about three to four years of background plate motion. So if this had happened all at once instead of two weeks, it would have generated a magnitude 6.8 earthquake. What's kind of scary is that in 1947, there was a magnitude 6.9 earthquake that happened along the same part of the fault at the plate interface. So, Oh, and this, this uh, magnitude 6.9 earthquake generated a large tsunami. What's even a little scarier is that in some cases, in other parts of the world, these slow slip events have been associated with actually setting off uh, large events like the uh, magnitude 9 Japan earthquake in 2011 and then the, the following tsunami. So, yeah, uh, you can imagine that there's been a lot of effort invested in modeling subduction zone behavior and also slow slip events. Uh, at, the, at this current, current state in time, uh, the fine details of these slow slip events aren't really well understood. So right now we have a kind of regional approximation for where these things are occurring, but we don't know their, the, we don't know exactly how they're distributed along the margin. Fortunately, um, this part of the margin provides us with a unique opportunity to study this type of uh, behavior along subduction zones because these, the plate interface sits at a relatively shallow depth of 15 kilometers uh, right at the coastline. So this is a map showing the, <clears throat> the seismic stations that we use for our project. The red are the pre-existing geonet stations. Um, and the blue ones are the ones that were deployed during the Hobbes experiment. Also, these are the, the black diamonds here are the events that we chose for this project before and after we relocated them. So the uh, open diamonds here are the locations of the events that were determined by GeoNet originally using just this part of the network. And then the filled in black diamonds are where they moved after we relocated them with the Hobbits seismometers. So the addition of the Hobbit seismometers into these relocations um, helps us to gain more accurate uh, estimations for where these locations are. And our goal is to help, is to help constrain models of um, the high sub subduction zone and also potentially of slow slip using earthquake focal mechanisms. 
So uh, these focal mechanisms, or beach balls as they're called informally, um, they not only help us understand what the geometry of the faulting looks like during the event, um, but you could, they also help us to define the state of stress at the time of the rupture. So within these shaded regions of the beach balls, um, we see that the, the tension axis uh, is embedded somewhere in there, and then in the uh, unshaded regions, the pressure axis is, is somewhere in there. And, and these two things um, are related to the maximum and minimum directions of compressional stress. So to actually help you kind of understand what goes into constructing these beach balls, um, I'm going to walk you guys through a very simplified uh, example here. So if you imagine that the center is the epicenter of an earthquake, um, and each of these little houses is a seismometer, uh, we can see that when an earthquake ruptures, there are uh, energies propagated in all directions around the epicenter. And so to denote these uh, the P waves, which are the, the first waves to arrive after an earthquake, uh, we're going to just kind of think of them as little flunkies for now. So, like I said, when the earthquake ruptures, uh, waves are, generate, are, are propagated in every direction surrounding it. Um, in these two quadrants here, the northwest and southeast quadrants, the rocks uh, directly around the source point uh, were originally compressed. Um, and in the other two quadrants, the northeast and the southwest, the other or the rocks were originally stretched apart um, or, or dilated. So, in the in the in the seismic data, these first arrivals appear as positive and negative polarity waves. Um, and so, what I had to do was look at first arrivals from every station in the network that we used and identify the polarity of the first arrivals. So, oh, and this is uh, an example of some of the data that we actually used. So, um, in some cases, the first arrivals were pretty clear, and in other cases, we had some very noisy data. Um, in a lot of cases, we weren't even able to identify the polarity of the first arrival. So, we can plot these stations on a stereographic projection um, and then we fit uh, potential fault planes um, that, that describe the geometry of the earthquake. Um, and again, notice that the tensional axes are uh, defined in this shaded region and the, uh, or the compressional, the pressure axes are defined by the shaded regions and the tensional axes are find in the other regions. Um, so the problem is that we get two potential fault plane solutions, and to actually decide which one describes the real uh, the, the fault that the earthquake ruptured on, we have to look at additional geological information. So <clears throat> obviously things aren't as simple as the example that I just walked you through. Um, how do we actually determine where the stations plot on a stereographic projection? So if we have a, an earthquake right here, um, we imagine a, a sphere that is surrounding the source point. And what we're actually plotting on this, this stereograph is where the rays intersect that sphere on their way to the seismic station. So this is actually dependent on the uh, the azimuthal direction between the vent and the stations, and also what the takeoff angle is here. Um, so, because in this in this equation here that describes the the wave parameter, uh, the wave parameter must remain constant, and the the angle of incidence or the takeoff angle is defined by the depth of the earthquake and also the velocity at the rupture point. So here are a couple examples of our actual results and what they look like. Um, you can see that in some cases we had a, a pretty good fit of uh, nodal plane solutions, and, and we think that they describe 
the geometry of faulting pretty well. Um, in, other, in other cases, though, we didn't have as much luck. And you can see here that in this particular example in the bottom right, um, a lot of our stations plotted uh, right around the same takeoff angle, the same distance from, from the center. And we think that that's because of the velocity model that we use to actually calculate the takeoff angles. So we used a global velocity model. Um, and I think that, well, in the past, this, this problem has kind of been addressed in a different study uh, by, by one of my mentors, former student. And he did a comparison of using a global velocity model versus a uh, more localized velocity model for his study region. And as you can see, especially in the uh, shorter distances between the events and the stations, uh, the, the takeoff angles change quite a bit. Um, and so while we, while we can resolve uh, some good solutions here, um, I think it would be interesting to take a look at what would happen if we used a more uh, localized velocity model for, for our earthquakes. So here are the, I'll call them preliminary results before we actually take a look at, at uh, the use of a new velocity model. Um, these larger beach balls are the ones that we actually calculated for our study. Um, and then the smaller ones that are plotted kind of in the background, they are focal mechanisms that were determined by um, GeoNet using moment tensor analysis. And as I mentioned before, um, the addition of the Hobbit's network um, off, offshore helps to better define the locations that we determine. So um, the GeoNet solutions, I'm a little hesitant to try to draw you know, very specific conclusions from them. And also because of, our, uh, because of the issue with the velocity model and our solutions, um, I don't want to draw any significant <coughs> interpretations. But in general, we see that the uh, well, first of all, the beach balls are colored by which depth that they were determined in. And we see that earthquakes are happening generally shallower near the trench, and they get deeper as you move inland. And um, that agrees with, with the you know, model of the subduction zone that we're, that we're thinking about here. Um, also, out here in these, in these shallower earthquakes, we see uh, a lot of normal faulting. Oh, I got to move on. I'm sorry, guys. Um, anyway, I'm just going to walk you really quickly through uh, what I've talked about in my talk. Um, so the slow slip events are important to understand for hazard assessment in New Zealand. Models of the high grand margin can benefit from having further constraints. Um, we can hopefully use focal mechanisms to provide these types of constraints, especially for the state of stress and the uh, geometry of faulting. And the use of the Hobbit's data is useful in relocating our earthquakes. Also, we would like to use a new velocity model to uh, rerun our analysis. Um, and our results do provide reasonable estimation for what the faulting looks like in the subsurface. So thank you very quickly to my mentors and everybody else that helped make this summer possible. I didn't realize that I was running so short on time. <laughs> Uh, I'll open the floor to any questions as well. Okay, any questions for Enrique? No? Oh. Um, okay, so you are obviously hesitant to interpret your mm -hmm. focal mechanism. Um, but I noticed that a lot of the ones that you actually calculated were strike slip. Mm -hmm. Do you think that those are going to change quite a bit? To a, like, I mean, it's interesting to see strike slip earthquakes in a subduction zone. Um, so, do you think that with a more local uh, velocity model, those would change to compressional, or do you think that they may remain strike slip, but the actual focal mechanisms may may sort of shift or the fall? Um, so, I think what will happen is the locations of these stations um, in the strike slip examples, they're going to move either closer or farther away from, from the center of the, uh, of the event. And 
if, if it gets too close over here to the side of the, the, of the stereo net, mm -hmm. then it'll actually end up plotting somewhere over here. And because they are di the, the two regions are diagonal from each other, I don't think it'll change the shape of the solutions much. Um, but in, in something like this one here, uh, some of these white uh, triangles may, may have plot somewhere over here and give it a better fit or something like that. So. Peter? Thanks, Enrique. Um, it's unfortunate that some of your stations you weren't able to identify the polarity of the signals. I'm wondering, were those noisy stations all in general in one area, or was it random which ones were noisy and approximately what fraction of the ones were too noisy to identify? So it, it varied between the events. It, I think it had to do more with where the earthquakes themselves ruptured in relation to these stations. So, you know, at one station for one event, we could have very clear data that gave us a very nice polarity arrival. Um, and in, in, if the earthquake is a little bit closer to those stations, then that's, I think, where we were having the most problems. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Any other questions? No? All right. Thanks, Enrique. Thanks.